So we're in the middle here. Um, we're talking about I'm kind of edging towards uh, convolution as the uh, multiplication of two z polynomials. Uh, last time we talked we talked about what a z transform is. Um, and uh, it is uh, many things, but but one thing that that it is uh, um, most simply is a polynomial in z. So it's got terms of z to the zeroth power. It's got terms of z. It's got terms of z squared. It's got terms of z to the minus 456 power. Uh, you know they're all they're all in there. Um, and the time series uh, is the coefficients. Of the z polynomial, as uh, as I talked about last time, and of course for a short time series, most of the coefficients are are zero. Uh, one thing that's happening here that that you'll uh, just have to get used to in, in these notes and in Claire Bout's books is that right away for simplicity, we're just assuming that delta t is one. Uh, that doesn't mean it, you know, it's, it, you just have to remember how to put in the actual delta t when you get to it. So the time sampling is even. There's a constant delta t, and for you know mathematical simplicity here, we're assuming delta t is one. So uh, this z to the minus one, you know, that is one time sample before zero time, one delta t before zero time. Um, z to the zeroth power, that's the the amplitude of the wave. One is the amplitude of the wave at at zero time. Two is the amplitude of the wave at one times. Uh, one times delta t. Oh, and I have to uh, switch tools. Sorry. Um, so we have, uh, uh, you know, the sample at time zero, index zero is one. The sample at time index one is two. The sample at time index two, you know, which is multiplied by z squared, is uh, zero, and so forth. So you can also express the z polynomial in this. Uh, in this form as a as a summation, right? X at time sample index i times z to the uh, power of i. Uh, what is z? Uh, we uh, will define it in several ways. The first way is as this unit delay operator, uh, which means that uh, uh, we can multiply our z polynomial x by z, okay, so that's operating on, on the z polynomial x by z. What does that do? It adds 1 to the time index okay, on, on the z part, which means that we're taking the whole thing and we're delaying it by, by one, uh, 1 times delta t, um, which here is just assumed to be 1, so it's not even figured in. Um, we found that uh, the z polynomial will do superposition. Just by adding two polynomials, so here's a shifted, um, you know, source time function. Here's the original source time function, shifted by ten samples, um, and then uh, uh, added added together, and very simply giving us the two, uh, you know, one size RAM with two versions of the reflection on it, of the of the wavelet. All right. Then we uh, we looked at taking the z polynomial that we developed. You know, x of z plus one half times z to the tenth power times x of z, same x of z in in, in both terms. You can uh, just as you can do with any polynomial, you can factor out. Uh, you can factor this into the polynomial one plus one half z to the tenth uh, times x of z. Okay. Well, this factor here is another z polynomial, and so now we have the uh, the idea that we can we can multiply z polynomials just like we can any other polynomial, and what does that do? Well, uh, you know, starting with this uh, this time series up here, what that's going to do is uh, uh, make that time series the convolution, okay, of these two spikes with this source time function, and the the one half is also uh, giving us some scaling there. All right, so the convolution is, uh, um, you know, when you convolve uh, any any function by a spike, uh, and if that spike has amplitude one, then you just get that same uh, that same function. 
which I've been calling a source time function. Uh, you know, if you convolve it with a spike that has amplitude half, then you get you get half of that uh, 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 source time function in amplitude. And you know, since this spike is delayed by ten time samples, then the uh, the convolution, you know, the the uh, uh, the impulse response of that source time function is also delayed by ten time samples. So uh, then, as a general example, you know, we just see all right, you know, we have uh, uh, a couple of z polynomials. How do we, uh, uh, you know, the product is called y. That's the the data. That's this y is this uh, seismogram uh, that that we're compositing here. And um, you know, we made that seismogram by addition, you know, by superposition, and now we're making the seismogram by convolution, you know, convolving these two spikes with. Uh, with that uh, that wavelet. Okay, so y is the uh, the z polynomial for the uh, uh, for the output for the seismogram, and it's the multiplication of these two um, of these two z polynomials. You know, expressed more generally here than just what we've had. Um, and one is one z polynomial is called x, and the other one is called f. Okay, so we have the the multiplication of, of x times f, or in terms of time series notation up here, uh, the convolution, that's what this star means, of x, x and f. Um, if we go through how we multiply the polynomials and express that as a, uh, and, and you do that in the lab too, um, then you express it as, um, as a summation, you find that it's uh, a relatively simple summation to make, you know, just dealing with the the components, the time series amplitudes that are in X and F, and there uh, uh, you might recognize this as a uh, as a convolution. Uh, so this is a convolution of uh, of discrete time series. Uh, there's a program for it in the in the uh, processing versus inversion book on page five, um, and then uh, you might recognize uh, the integral version of this. You know, I'm dropping the limits here. The integral version is uh, is convolution in continuous form. So y is basically an integral that uh, that plays off the multiplication of x, um, you know, the input time series by the elements of the filter time series. But notice that the filter is you know while this is being uh, 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 integrated, you know, t is constant while this is being integrated. So this is getting us one. You know, we need a whole integration just to get us one time sample of the of the output y. So if we got if we want to get a thousand time samples of the output, we got to integrate a thousand times. Okay. So convolution takes uh, uh, you know if you have a if you have two time series and they're on the order of uh, of of say uh, n um, samples long, you know they're both n samples. Then convolution is going to take uh, n squared multiplications. So it's a fairly uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, com compute intensive process, um, and then here's a, uh, uh, a kind of computer memory you know representation of what's happening in the convolution, and you uh, overlap the uh, input time series, which you can see is in order, you know, increasing in time to the right, and the uh, the filter time series is uh, uh, is 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 in reverse order. It's increasing in time to the left. And for a particular t, you have a certain amount of overlap. You multiply the overlapping, um, you multiply the overlapping samples and, and add them, just like doing an inner product. Um, and, uh, and that gives you the, and then add them together. And that gives you the output at that, at that time, at that lag, if you will. So that's. Uh, uh, you know that's visualizing convolution in 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 several different ways, uh, and we're going to come back to that uh, you know in in the labs and and uh, and many times. Uh, so so all right, we've represented time series as polynomials, and there's you know some useful things we can do with these time series like add them together, adding polynomials, um, like uh, convolving them together, you know doing filtering. Which is just multiplying polynomials, okay? 
So we have these useful things we can do. And now we can explore, you know, there's lots of other things that we can do with polynomials. We can factor polynomials. Any polynomial can be factored. You know, just uh, think back to uh, uh, you know, the worst part of your, of your algebra classes in high school, and, and there it is. Okay? Um, and I think in the, uh, in the lab, I've, I try to give you some polynomials that you can factor on inspection. But you know, there's, there's lots of ways to factor polynomials. It's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a big problem in, in math. And so you know, in doing your work, you're going you're gonna to apply whatever you, whatever you need to to factor your polynomial. Okay? The examples I'll show you, of course, are all perfectly set up so that they factor easily. right? Okay. So we have a, a time series. Ah, and here's another concept that I that I I have not uh, um, I have not uh, explicitly talked about yet. Really, I'm not going to make any distinction between a time series, a filter, a data series. For me, you know, especially in terms of Z transforms, they're all the same thing. A time series can be a filter. It might, it might not be a filter. It can be data. It can be input. Um, the only th the only thing that I'm worried about here is that every time series, every filter, every data series is a polynomial. Okay. Of course, this applies to one dimensional uh, series. So they can be spatial series. They don't have to be time series. But they can only be one dimensional. Um, we can. Uh, and Clairbot actually has has some very interesting ideas about how to handle two dimensional spatial series, uh, or or as as he's done, you know, uh, time in one dimension and space in another, and he can apply a lot of these same ideas uh, and write them down as as uh, as z polynomials. But we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just deal with one dimensional data series. Uh, they are discrete data series. You know, these are not continuous functions. For which we have a closed form algebraic representation. Okay, so we got a polynomial. We know that all polynomials can be factored. All right, let me show you a simple time series. Uh, at time zero, it's uh, uh, it's got an amplitude of two. At uh, time one, one times delta t, it's got an amplitude of minus one. At time two times delta t, it's got an amplitude of minus two. I'm sorry, minus one. Um, we represent that uh, notice I've used a small letter y uh, when I write out the time series as an ordered list, and I use a capital Y when I write it as a Z transform, because you know actually what I would say is that between time and Z, I'm making a transform. I'm transforming a time series, an ordered list, into a Z polynomial. Okay. But you can see it's it's very simple to take that ordered list and transform it into a z polynomial. We have two times z to the zeroth power, minus one times z to the first power, minus one times z to the second power, and then you can see I've I've made it very simple. Okay, I've also made I've concocted this time series so it's easy to factor, right? Um, and this is uh, uh, two plus. You know, we have two time series here. 1 is 2 plus z. The second time series is 1 minus z. Um, so let's see. To, uh, uh, to compute it, uh, to multiply these two, we would say 2 times 1 plus, um, so that would be 2 times 1 times z to the 0th power. Then we have uh, z times 1 plus minus z times 2. Um, so that's what's left over is minus 1 times z to the first power. And then we have z times minus z. And so we have minus z squared. OK, so that's, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, expanding that beyond three time uh, samples you know, will give you this, uh, this formula for, uh, for actually computing the product. OK, um, so now I can say, all right, I've got these factors. And I'll just say, all right, this is time series. This is z polynomial a. 1 minus z is z polynomial b. OK, and now I can see that uh, the output y is the convolution 
uh, and, and written as a star in the time domain here, discrete time domain or, or continuous time domain, of you know, these two, uh, the convolution of these two two-length time series, right? There's only samples at, uh, at zero time and, and one times delta t, right? The first series is two, then one. The second series is one, then minus one. Okay, so we can find two series that, when convolved, yield the data output series. And, and this, is, this is kind of a, a in a way, um, at least people used to think that, you know, given an earthquake seismogram, say, if you could just factor it, then you could find all of the, you could find the source time function, you could find the, the uh, uh, you could find the, the focal mechanism, you could find the, um, uh, the shallow uh, soil uh, structure. You could you could find the basin structure. You could find the mantle structure. You know, and all that is just from factoring one seismogram, right? Uh, that's a very difficult that's a very difficult process, and and I'll tell you, you certainly need more than just one seismogram to find any of those things. But um, but theoretically. It's it's true. So this is kind of like the ideal. You know what we would ideally like to do is take any seismogram, exploration or earthquake, uh, or or we could have any other data series. Um, you know, say uh, GPS positions. Um, you know, versus time, uh, even at a at a at the uh, at one place. And if we could if 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 we could just factor it, then then we would know everything. We would have everything set. Okay. Now, as I explained, you know, there's there's noise that comes in before convolution, before multiplying the series, before mu multiplying the z polynomials. There's noise that comes in after multiplying them, but but there's this idea that through the the physical model involving filtering, if we could just factor these z polynomials, we could understand everything. Okay, so that's kind of one idea, one way to look at this. Okay. Um, and you can use all these tools that we'll come up with, you know, so long as you can express your your data series as z polynomials. And uh, of course, if your data are evenly sampled in time or space, then it's much easier to uh, uh, to express uh, the data series in this way that we'll work on. So really, uh, what uh, what I'm going to explain over the next half of the semester is uh, you know what are the the simple things we can do to understand um, evenly sampled one-dimensional data series, uh, such as seismograms. Seismograms are the most common example that we use. Uh, okay, so so I referred again to the physical model, all right, and uh, you know I introduced this word filter without talking too much about it, but let me just remind you that the idea is we have an input. And then we have a, uh, and in, in reflection seismology, the input would be the series of, of uh, reflectivities versus depth or versus two way travel time, you know, as that, that, that would go into making up a, um, uh, making up a, a seismic section. Okay, so at one spot, you know, if you drill down, you'll, you'll see different interfaces and different reflection coefficients. As you drill down, and and the, uh, the the idea of this Earth response is is that it's fairly simple and it's just a bunch of spikes. Okay, that's a that's a very fundamental idea in in the interpretation of, of exploration seismograms. So then you um, uh, you apply a uh, a filter. You convolve X with the filter F, uh, and here they're just written as time series F of T. Um, the filter would be, say, the source, the explosion or vibrosized source that we that we uh, hit that Earth response with, and so a bunch of spikes are going to yield to a whole series of of copies of that source time time function, and the output, of course, is the measured seismogram. So this is uh, this is the simple, you know, uh, seismic reflection stack interpretation way of trying to uh, Trying to understand, uh, trying to factor your data, so we can, you know, as 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 any earthquake seismologists know, um, 
you know, maybe our for earthquakes our input would not be the Earth response; it would be the the uh, rise time of the uh, of the rupture time function, um, and we wouldn't have just one filter; we'd have many. Um, you know, I could mention the uh, uh, the rupture uh, propagation. I could mention the uh, uh, the near source 3D structure, I could mention the basin structure, the mantle structure. Um, uh, you know, you end up writing a whole row of these filters, but they all get convolved, they all get multiplied, all those z polynomials get multiplied, and you still end up with an output seismogram y. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, for us us boneheaded um, reflection seismologists, we want the simplest possible model. We don't, we we just want an input. We want a filter. We want an output, and that's what this model is. Okay. So uh, you know we can have any any uh, any time series, and and in fact we know that you know if we have a uh, you know maybe this is the earthquake problem, and this fil this one filter here incorporates all those effects. You know maybe there's 13 different effects. You know attenuation, uh, scattering, all of those. You know are 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 a whole composition of you know maybe twelve different filters, okay? But we can represent it as one filter at first, and then uh, we can work on factoring it further. So we could factor f into a and b. Uh, we could factor f into a b c d e f g h i j k if we if we need to. All right, at least that's the hope. So that's the. Uh, uh, that's the meaning of a filter, and and of course, you know, in, in one in one kind of work, you know, you're going to re regard one thing like a source time function. You know, here it's regarded as the filter for reflection seismology and earthquakes. It's regarded as the input. Um, let's see, uh, in uh, in. Uh, um, the kind of uh, seismic imaging that I do, the source time function, is one of the filters. Um, so you know, uh, these things switch around depending on, on what problem you're working on. You know, what's the input? What's the filter? What does the filter contain? What does the input contain? That's uh, uh, that's determined by the problem you have, the exact problem you have. Okay. So if um, uh, if we have a z polynomial, if we have a time series that we represent as a z polynomial with uh, terms x sub n times z to the power of n, and n is less than zero, okay, uh, and that's that's in what we're calling a filter, all right, then that is what we call a non-realizable filter, all right. So let's think about it. If if uh, if the filter is supposed if the filter contains something that's in negative time, that means it's gonna it's gonna respond to you know we, we reverse the filter right so it respond to data that hasn't come in yet if it's in negative time it's 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 moving um, let me go to this illustration all right so if the filter has some negative time components they'd be up here. And so that means that uh, it's responding to the to input that hasn't come in yet, right? This is the convolution at uh, at t equals zero, and it's using the filter at t equals zero and the and the input at t equals zero. This is the input at t equals one. If we have to access that with a negative time element to the filter out here, then you know we don't have that input yet. Okay, so. Now these days, uh, uh, almost everything is is done through the computer, and so you know a non-realizable filter is um, is not a problem. Uh, it is a problem if you try to build a circuit that that filters a uh, uh, a time series as the data comes in. So, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, It'll turn out that that a very efficient filter that one could imagine using for uh, to filter out high frequencies before dig digitizing, right? A uh, an anti-aliasing filter, a very efficient filter um, would have negative time components once it's written down 
as a z polynomial. Okay, uh, but you can't build a circuit that has that that has that uh, um, that has that accesses data before it comes in. Okay, you have to now. There's all kinds of tricks people use now because because field computers are so fast. You know, even your cell phone uses non-realizable filters to uh, send and receive uh, uh, conversations. And those, what it does is it, it, packets, it packages up your conversation in literally like hundredth of a, uh, hundredth of a second slices. And so it can use a non-realizable uh, filter on that hundredth of a second slice. And the whole delay is only you know, two hundredths of a second. So you might never notice. Okay, but if you if you hear echoes, you know if you if you have a bad cell phone connection and it's having to you know stretch out that non-realizable filter to like a half a second or a second, which does happen sometimes if you have a bad connection, then then uh, that's when you can tell that uh, that your cell phone that that you have a uh, your cell phone is using a non-realizable filter, and it's trying to cheat, uh, but it's not having you know it doesn't have a good enough connection to uh, to cheat well, you know, you, you start to notice it. Okay, so uh, a non-realizable filter needs uh, current input. It needs the previous input, and it also, you know, having those negative comp negative time components in the filter f, it, it needs inputs that uh, that are not yet arrived. So you can only use it retrospectively. Okay, and then you can tell, you know, when your cell phone is trying to cheat too much, and and it it can't use it retrospectively. Okay, so uh, what we've done now is we've we've kind of set up uh, a framework that we can work in. We can we can represent time series in several ways. We can represent them as z polynomials. There are a lot of useful things we can do with z polynomials, um, like factor them that uh, have this meaning of of you know if we can factor the z polynomial, then um, we can maybe figure out we can separate the Earth response from the filter source, right? I mean, at least in size and reflection, that's what we'd really like to do. We'd like to, we'd like to get the, the arrival time and the reflection coefficient for each of those, ref, each of those interfaces. You know? And, and, and uh, if to do that best, we should really try to, to you know, deconvolve, to factor out the source time function, which may be much more complicated than a spike. And it, in fact, always is much more complicated than a spike. OK. Um, so you guys are probably sitting here thinking, well, you know, time series are you know, usually at least 1,000 samples long. And you know, in earthquake seismology, you know, we're dealing with time series, you know, say, for day-long cross-correlations that are you know, uh, a million points long. Which means we're building z, z polynomials that have a million um, terms, right? Because there's one term in the z polynomial for every time step. Okay, so we have million dimensional vectors. We have million term um, z polynomials. You know, it's there's something in there, you know, times z to the millionth power, right? And we're trying to factor that. Okay, we could, you know, there are ways of doing that. All right, we will look at some of those ways eventually, but uh, Fourier analysis offers us the simplest, the most accurate, the uh, uh, the most consistent way of solving these factoring problems. Okay, we'll 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 understand why in a bit. Okay, um, but uh, uh, a lot of this class is really about Fourier analysis. Um, because of its huge convenience that, that it offers us. Okay? It offers us computational speed. It offers us, uh, in, in the end, I'll explain exactly why later, the uh, Fourier analysis offers us um, also theoretical simplicity. All right? There's a lot of things that we can express um, that we can express in the Fourier domain in a simple, closed form, you know, algebraic expression that are way too complicated to write down 
in the time domain. Um, now, you probably know that Fourier analysis involves comparing our data to sines and cosines. Okay? And, and why is that useful? Why are, why are sines and cosines uh, uh, a good model for some natural process like, like seismic wave propagation? Okay? My explanation here is that in nature, you find physical laws that we can express as partial differential equations. And with most things, at least that I'm interested in, those partial differential equations contain second derivatives. All right, so here's a wave equation, which of course is something that we're, we're very much involved with in seismology. And this is a simple acoustic, scalar acoustic wave equation. There's just one equation. Uh, this is the, the pressure in the fluid. All right, so maybe we're, we're hitting, um, you know, Graham's uh, chirp device is, is hitting the water with, uh, with pings and sending acoustic waves down through, uh, say, Pyramid Lake, as we did a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, we want to uh, use, you know, the propagation of those waves to understand the structure of Pyramid Lake. All right. So um, uh, in the water and in the, the very, very wet mud uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the lake, there's no, there's no rigidity, right? So there's not going to be any, any you know, the, the propagation velocity of shear waves is zero when, they're, when rigidity is zero. So we don't have any, any, surface wa any shear waves. We don't have any surface waves. Uh, all we have are P waves, OK? All, we, all we're, you know, the, the chirp device it's uh, creating a it's creating pressure pulses, and it's it's uh, taking data by measuring pressure transients. Okay, so it basically makes a, a the chirp device makes a recording of pressure versus time. Actually, at several points within the chirp fish. Um, so uh, uh, the the parameter of interest here is the pressure in the fluid. And that's this capital P here. And pressure is just a scalar. It doesn't have a direction, right? So that, uh, that's fine. So we have uh, uh, pressure being the, um, uh, you know, if we can understand the pressure field and, and how, the, uh, how the pressure field is propagating as waves and how they interact with the, the, uh, uh, the sediments at the bottom of Pyramid Lake, then we can make an image of the faults in the lake. Uh, which is what Amy Isis did for her thesis, uh, and made a tectonic interpretation of that of the of those images. All right, and that that came from waves that uh, uh, that propagated according to a wave equation that is just this simple. Okay, so that uh, uh, and, and of course most of the biggest seismic surveys done now are done offshore and uh, and are done using P waves, and so. Uh, uh, this this uh, equation here is extremely useful, okay, uh, and we're going to be looking at it uh, in several different ways. So, what is the wave equation saying? It's saying that the second derivative in the x direction of the pressure field uh, plus the second derivative in the z or depth direction of the pressure field, okay, is equal to uh, this factor is equal to a factor of the second time derivative of the pressure field. Okay, we'll derive this equation later, but basically these these uh, second derivatives uh, in space come from the constitutive relation, basically the incompressibility of water. Uh, you know, water is relatively incompressible, but but you know you apply enough pressure and you get a certain compression. Um, and the uh, uh, um, and then of course uh, uh, if there are waves propagating around, then they're changing in time as well as space. So uh, uh, the wave equation here says that um, you know what are waves obey this equation. What are acoustic waves obey this equation? What is this c term? That's actually the uh, the speed of wave propagation in the acoustic medium. So in, 
in in water, uh, that would very simply be fifteen hundred meters a second. Okay, and that's all that c would be. Uh, so it's just a scalar factor, a and really uh, this you know this simple uh, second derivative uh, uh, e uh, equation is uh, is all we need actually to uh, to talk about uh, everything we will in this class. Um, now. You may suspect here, you know, if you solve a, uh, a first order uh, differential equation, you know, you basically that means you need to make the first derivative of a function look like the function. So, what kind of functions solve uh, uh, differential equations containing first derivatives? Okay, they tend to be exponential functions, right? The derivative of an exponential is another exponential, you know, with some with some other you know, with some other stuff. Um, if we have a, uh, you know, what, what kind of function is equal to a second derivative? Okay, well, there's the sine and cosine, right? If you take, if you take a, uh, 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 if you differentiate the sinusoid, you get the cosinusoid, and then if you differentiate the cosinusoid, you get another sinusoid back. I mean, there's changes in, in, in uh, there's changes in in, in uh, phase and and and, and amplitude and and uh, and all that, but uh, um, you know you this is this is one way that's one way of getting this equation to work. You know you got to make the second derivative. Um, you know so you take a second derivative of sinusoidal uh, pressure versus z function, and you get and you get uh, uh, a sinusoid, which is also the second derivative of a pressure versus time function. Okay, so that's why the sinusoids and cosinusoids um, work very well. Uh, you know, are, are the solution to these equations, and uh, why waves are, are uh, you know, why you get resonance and all that because this equation is solved by sinusoids and cosinusoids. Um, so. Uh, 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 because of, of you know the the application of this uh, um, of this you know relatively simple equation to all our work, and you know even even if you go to a, a wave equation that's vector and includes all the possible three D effects, it's still going to be going to have second derivatives in it. Okay, uh, yeah. When you when you include um, intrinsic attenuation, it only has first derivatives. You know there will be terms with a, with a first derivative, but uh, every other term than that is going to have second derivatives, and so you know the the solutions are mainly sinusoids, okay, um, and Fourier analysis is built with sinusoids as a basis, so that's why it's so useful uh, in solving these problems. Now, uh, for for uh, algebraic simplicity. We're going to set up our Fourier analysis to use this Euler complex exponential, and I suppose this I should have put a box around this this equation here because this is one you want to memorize if you haven't seen it before. Okay, uh, this uh, uh, this is the definition of this Euler exponential, as I'll call it, and and you can see it's e to an imaginary power. Okay, e to the minus i omega t, um, and uh, uh, and and this definition basically it's it's making sinusoids look like exponentials. Okay, uh, and that brings us a little bit of algebraic simplicity. Okay, along with you know sometimes some some you know potential for error or, or artifacts actually. Um, so the uh, uh, e to the uh, minus i omega t is equal to the cosine of omega t uh, minus i sine omega t. If uh, if this is a if if instead it's e to the plus i omega t, then the the definition is cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Okay. So what this is basically representing is this is uh, 
uh, e to the uh, i omega t is one complex number. Okay. Sometimes I'll even call it a complex scalar. All right. And that complex number consists of a real part, the cosine omega t, and also an imaginary part. Okay. This part that is after the i. Uh, and and this is you know. Uh, 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 if you hadn't uh, looked at uh, complex analysis before, it's really just a, a, an interesting mathematical way of representing a vector in a, in a 2D plane. And, and the 2D plane, we actually have a name for it. We're going to use it a lot. It's called the z-plane. All right, uh, And we're, we're going to later on connect that to the z-transform even. Um, so, uh, uh, and where does the z come from? OK, the, the, the real part of a complex number is often called x. And the uh, the imaginary part of the complex number is called y, uh, particularly because you know we draw um, we draw the z plane having uh, a real axis, uh, and that's so that's x, and uh, and an imaginary axis, imaginary z z is a complex number. Uh, and so that equals y, and so here's our complex number z, okay, which is equal to x plus i y, right? And uh, of course, you know, since since uh, so this is uh, you know that distance. Well, let's see, maybe I should draw it better than that. Um, All right, so there's the complex number as a vector, and its uh, its x component is uh, is x, and its y component is y. All right, uh, and of course since these are two components of a vector, you know, like uh, northing and easting, you can't just add them, right? You gotta you gotta keep them separate. So we have to keep track of the the imaginary parts versus the real parts, um, and um, um, so this complex exponential is a is a complex number of that of that form, right? X is equal to cosine omega t, um, y is equal to uh, sine of omega t, um, and. Uh, you know, the minus i means if, if the sine of omega t is positive, then we go to, onto the minus y part. All right. Um, and of course, the complex number has a, a magnitude, which is just the length of this vector. Uh, you would calculate the magnitude by taking the square root of the sum of x squared plus y squared. Right. Um, the thing that uh, where vector analysis doesn't help you in dealing with complex numbers is that you can you can multiply complex numbers, you can divide complex numbers, and I can't even remember the formulas for those. I have to look them up every time. Okay, you, you multiply them by by you know putting the x's and y's together from from the two uh, the two operands. You divide them the same way, um, and and there's kind of these complicated formulas to do that. Uh, you'll see those later, actually, in 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 lab five. Um, you'll 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 look at a program that contains those you know complex number multiplying and dividing formulas. So you know we don't have a we don't have a um, you know it's one way of doing it. We don't have a, a, a standard way of of multiplying two vectors together, right? Uh, but we do have a standard way of of multiplying two complex numbers together. So. Uh, it's just a. It, you just have to make sure you find the right formula. Um, you can you can add them, right? So uh, you know we add another complex number, right? We just go to uh, and, and that's easy to do, right? Um, you know if we have uh, you know z two, that would be uh, x two plus i y two, and then uh, you know z plus z2 is equal to x plus x2 uh, plus uh, i y plus uh, y2. Got to make sure I keep clear what's uh, uh, what's the imaginary part. 
so they do add and subtract just like vectors. Okay, that's no problem. Um, and it's only two-dimensional uh, as well. So, so okay, weird uh, complex uh, um, uh, notation. And then we're further uh, uh, taking advantage of this Euler exponential to, to easily you know, express as this one simple exponential this rather complicated uh, complex sinusoid. Okay. And um, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's what Fourier analysis is based on. So the, um, uh, just another thing, um, uh, the, uh, the omega is the rotational frequency. So it's 2 pi times the frequency in hertz. So another way of writing that would be that uh, Omega is uh, two pi times f. Okay. Uh, so omega is in radians per second. F is in uh, per second, cycles per second. All right. Just uh, some some basic units there, uh, and that's a convenient way for us to um, um, write the cosine. You know, you got to you got to feed it a unitless number, right? So. Um, you need to uh, multiply omega times t because you need to multiply the seconds in the time against the uh, one over time uh, units of the uh, of the frequency. So that's uh, and and you know you want it in radians too. It'll it'll uh, it's easy to understand uh, if it's in uh, if it's in radians at least sometimes. Okay, so. Um, what we have is a um, um, the, what Fourier analysis is is going to pick apart for us is this basis unit that I call the Fourier component. All right, and and that Fourier component is at one frequency, and uh, and it's a scalar, but it's a complex scalar, right? So the complex uh, Fourier component has a real part and an imaginary part, all right. And you can see those together in that in that uh, FFT lab uh, app that uh, uh, it'll show you the uh, real and imaginary parts in both space uh, or time. Okay, so it'll show you the real and imaginary parts of the seismogram. Uh, and of course, we know a data seismogram should not have any imaginary part. We'll talk about that. And it will also show you the uh, uh, the real and imaginary parts of a uh, uh, of the Fourier components. Okay, and you'll see them as series. So uh, you know, and and we can uh, we can take a closer look at the FFT lab uh, uh, later on. But uh, you know, along with the time series. It shows you the frequency series, which is what, which is these Fourier components, one at every frequency sample. Okay, and so uh, that's uh, that's what you're looking at in uh, FFT lab. Uh, okay, I got to stop there.